All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of um, Third Thursdays offered by the San Jose Museum of Art. My name is Robin Treen, and I work for the San Jose Museum of Art. And um, tonight we're doing another online version of Third Thursdays, and we're uh, partnering once again with our good friends at Mosaic America um, to present a program tonight that um, seems very seasonal. Um, in good November, evening, everybody, and well, oops. <laughs> in November, we uh, celebrate the Day of Mortos. My name is Robin Treen and I work for the San Jose Museum of Art. And um, tonight we're doing another online version of Third Thursdays. All right, that was interesting, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all set? <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, uh, I was just saying that we're um, partnering once again with Mosaic America tonight. And, um, you know, in November, at the beginning of the month, we celebrate Dia de los Muertos, which um, is, you know, a, a, a very specific but very interesting um, cultural tradition around death and dying and remembrance and how we... Uh, mourn and grieve and also how we remember um, those who have been with us and are, are not anymore, who are lost. So um, there's a lot of really interesting traditions around the world and we decided it would be really fun to um, look at some of those and it's specific to music. So tonight we're gonna be listening to some original compositions that are uh, looking at very different musical traditions that have to do with mourning and remembrance and um, loss and death and memories um, of that and what those traditions are like. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my good friend Usha and she is going to um, introduce the program for tonight. So thank you Usha, happy to have you us again. <laughs> thank you Robin. Um, hello, good evening everybody and thank you for joining us. We are always pleased to be part of the Third Thursday programs because we love the, the audience be able to assemble. 
Uh, I'm Usha Srinivasan, and I'm the co-founder and president of Mosaic America. Our mission is to help strengthen American communities and move them from diversity to belonging. Um, and all the programming we do really is aimed at fostering inclusion and cultivating a sense of belonging. And we do this through the use of the arts. Oftentimes we will commission works that help us not only showcase the brilliant diversity that surrounds us in our communities, but also helps draw attention to the common ties that bind us all. So Music in Memoriam is one of those uh, commissioned works and it was curated and led artistically by Dr. Ray Furuta, who is Mosaic's musical director. And it features compositions by five composers from culturally distinct and different backgrounds and also lived experiences. And uh, they drew inspiration from um, rituals around death and mourning and composed these new works. And we premiered this uh, right around Day of the Dead, Dia de los Muertos. And today we are happy to share with you some excerpts from this presentation. Um, but because we wanna make sure that you have wonderful um, uh, audio and video quality, we are going to have you watch it on YouTube. Uh, by the way, I have a couple of people say that they don't have sound. Mm -hmm. um, is that just John and Linda or other people having this issue? Um, I'm not sure it's anything on our end. So um, are some people, okay. So there are people who are able to hear fine, yes. Um, Hopefully John and Linda, you're able to fix the issue. So what we're gonna do is have you go to YouTube and we're gonna drop a link in the chat window. Have you go to YouTube to experience this live stream in very high quality. And when you're done, simply come back to the Zoom webinar. And uh, Alison, if you will just share the slide, what we're gonna do is drop the link for YouTube in the chat window. All you need to do is click on it and you can go off and enjoy it. And the stream will end it's a 20 minute stream. And then when it ends, we've come back here. And at 7.30, we will begin a conversation with two culture bearers who will bring some very interesting insights mm -hmm. on these um, rites of passage, on um, veneration of those that have passed on um, from their own unique cultures. So if you go to the chat window and please click on the link, um, is everyone able to? Alison, could you just drop the link, please? Well, let me see if I can. Okay, here we go. All right. And click on it. And then when you come back, you just have to click on the Zoom icon on your dock at the bottom of the screen and you'll be back here. And if you ever get lost, please just, uh, you will see a link to the Zoom session in the YouTube chat window. So you have multiple ways to find your way back. So we'll see you back here very soon. Thank you. Thanks, Usha.
All right, we are back. Hope everyone enjoyed that presentation. Um, Fabulous. Pleased to bring it to you and uh, welcome Chike, welcome Kisa, if you wanna get on video. So um, as most of our uh, works, at most of our presentations, we usually have a component of um, conversations after the presentation. So people can ask questions of the artists and others. And today is, so, is no different, but today we have a special treat. We have two wonderful culture bearers representing two very distinct cultures who will talk to us a little bit about the traditions uh, from their cultures surrounding death, mourning, honoring um, the forefathers and so on. So first I'd like to introduce them and then we will get started. I wanna read out a brief bio. Please meet Chike Nwafia, who Chike is an actor, director, educator, an award-winning filmmaker and a member of the Screen Actors Group. What does it look like, Stephen? Oh, <laughs> sorry. He is streaming now. Oh, cool. Looks good. Looks good. We've got uh, both YouTube, Facebook Live. Okay. Okay, so I think you um, are not. So you want to intro a little? <laughs> Sorry. What, what's life without a few interruptions? Two minutes, right? and then we should get started because we already have fifty plus what people. What's going on? <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. I'm sorry. Amazing. It's 601. Our labor is torn. All right. <laughs> Ghosts. You know, you're talking about dead and deceased. Maybe that was once. I, I think it was a recording. Anyway, sorry about that. Sorry we got interrupted while I was um, introducing our wonderful Chike. So Chike is the founding director of Silicon Valley African F Film Festival, the only California film festival focused exclusively on films by African filmmakers. Chike's creative project includes a multidisciplinary interactive presentation of the African story and diaspora. So please welcome Chike. And um, Kisa, Kisa Ocampo is the CEO and founder of the Positive Impact Creative and Brand Agency, We Spark, and a two-time Emmy award-winning director, writer, and producer for television. She's been lauded during her career with the world's largest distributor of Filipino media, ABAS CBN International. She serves as the vice president and content creator for the Filipino food movement and host of its weekly show, Culinaria Live. Uh, welcome, Kisa. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to get started with Kisa and Chike. And of course, to add to the cultural diversity of the panel, I come from Southern India and I'm Hindu by religion. And we have Robin Tree, who is Irish American. So we have a good mix of people who can weigh in on our, um, what these rituals look like in our own traditions. But first I would like to start with Chike. Chike and then Kisa, if you would please kind of introduce yourself, your culture and what these rituals and ceremonies look like in it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be here to share. Um, as has been said, my name is Chike Wafia and I come from the southeastern region of Nigeria. My ethnic group is Igbo. My name Chike itself actually um, is very interesting in terms of every name from my culture is a combination of two or more words. And from that, you get the meaning of the name. C-H-I-K-E is a combination of two words. The first word is C-H-I, which is Chi, which is the breath of God, the personification of God in you. My people believe that when God created all, God gave a little piece of himself to each and every one. And that is the Chi that the God gave you. The second part of my name, I-K-E, is power. So my name means the power of your God. Why do I start from that? When we want to discuss or talk about the transition, from this life to the next, one has to understand um, this, you know, the belief of a people. And so my people believe that life in itself never really ends. This body that we inhabit um, transitions. And so there's a, a circle of life starts, the fact there is no entry point in, 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 in essence. Um, we are experiencing this plane that we are experiencing. And then we move on to the next, and then we get, we come back and we come back and we move on. And so understanding that therefore, um, we see that, you know, when we are manifesting this physical plane, there are rights 
of passage on several rights that happen, rights of birth, rights of naming. And then as one is growing into, you know, from childhood, from infancy to adulthood, uh, up until the final right that now beats you into the next, the next phase of your spiritual life. Um, and so for us, um, death and ceremonies around death really are there to, um, you see in specific things that are done. And we don't have a whole, yeah, a lot of time to go into all the specific, but just generally speaking, when somebody passes on, the ceremonies, the rituals that are conducted are all in service of the person's continued journey. And so what happens then is there is a process of preparing the body, washing the body, you know, laying things out, and then an orchestrated process of working because we believe that when somebody stops breathing, quote and unquote, dies, that there is a period where the person's spirit is still around us. And then it is for those of us that those are living here to now orchestrate a process to guide that spirit from this plane into the next plane so that they can fully transition into the ancestral plane and then they can join the ancestors. So the rituals, the music, the dance, the, the chants and everything, the prayers that are conducted, the way people come in and out of the space where the person is lying in, in state, who is even able to come in. The, all of those things are pretty much testament to the person's life and then an appeal of sort to the ancestors to say, you gave us this person, we are returning the person to you. The, here is the person's calling card. This is what they have done. This is why we believe they are worthy of coming into your esteemed place of ancestral plane. And please, we beg of you to open the pathway and accept this honored prince or princess and let them come in, let the gates fling open and let them move. And so all of that happens. And it takes, in some places, it takes weeks, some places it takes days, but that process has to be complete. And when we know we have done it, we believe the person's spirit now transitions into the ancestral plane. Failing which, if for any reason that those rituals are not done or are done carelessly, we believe that the spirit never transitions and therefore the spirit might become angry and begin to visit his anger on those of us who are the living, who did not do what we needed to do to get the person off to the ancestral plane. So that kind of, in essence, captures what we do uh, when we bid somebody farewell into the great beyond, as we call it. And, um, and we ask the person, please, in your next life, come back again to us, uh, because we believe that the person is gonna reincarnate. If not in this lifetime, it might be several generations later. But I will stop until, you know, and I think we're gonna revisit some of these issues later. But um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation, thanks. That was really fascinating, Chiki, and I can see the parallels between what you just outlined and the rituals and traditions in my own Hindu religion. Um, but going to Kisa, um, please tell us a little bit about your the traditions that are followed in Philippines. And I know that's a very diverse region, but anything you can do to kind of shed light on the parallel rituals and ceremonies and traditions would be great. Actually, there are so many parallels to many of the things that Chike had brought up. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to preface this by saying that so much of what is practiced culturally in the Philippines has been, um, I want to say, influenced by religion, right? So pre-colonial, um, during pre-colonial times and in ancestral times, a lot of what kind of governed the general practice of spirituality was what I believe is closest to what they now call pantheism, right? A belief that God is in everything. God is in nature. It is in deities. Um, God is among us. And so are our ancestors. Um, back in the day, what they used to do when um, people would pass on, 
is they would keep their remains in earthenware jars. And those jars were placed at the mouths or the openings of caves. As a matter of fact, um, when I was directing a TV series uh, around uh, three years ago, I had the chance to visit a tribe in the, one of the northern provinces called Sagada. And the name of that um, group of people is Ifugao. So they're called the Ifugao people. Um, what they used to do back then was when somebody would die, they would actually place them seated on a chair until they reach rigor mortis. So you can imagine like, you know, the person's kind of bent, right? As if on a chair. And then they would have this whole parade of bringing the person from the house where they would have the wake um, from the house into this area where it's almost like the side of a mountain, um, and what they would do is they would raise the chair with rope and almost like break the bones. So, you know, when, when we were told about this process and this, um, this practice, you could actually hear the bone crunching, right? So that the bodies could actually fit in small coffins that were um, embedded along the side of the mountain. And as a matter of fact, you can still visit some of these uh, holy and sacred sites in a place called the Hanging Coffins of Sagada. Um, so it's pretty interesting, but you know, once we kind of go into the Christian era, and you know, um, around eighty percent of the Filipino people, um, you know, they identify as Christian or Catholic. Uh, there are many practices that have to do with the Catholic or Christian faith. So, for example, when someone dies, there is a process of mourning and a wake, which we call lamai. Um, that's usually done at a house or at a mortuary or sometimes like even out in the street, right? Like they'll put a big tent and, um, you know, the coffin is placed there with a lot of flowers. And the whole point of a wake is for people to stay awake, right? So what people would do to do that, to stay awake is there would be a party, you know, like Filipinos and food. Um, anytime there's a gathering, there's always food. It's always a party. So, you know, they would have an entire spread of different kinds of Filipino traditional cu cuisine. There would be um, music. So imagine like karaoke, there would be card games, even gambling um, for people to stay awake. There's also a practice of what we call a buloy or a donation that's monetary to help in, you know, either um, the funeral expenses or to assist the bereaved family um, financially. But furthermore, into the more Catholic practice, there is a thing that we do called pasham. And sham, which is the root word, translates into the number nine. So what that means is that there is a nine-day novena or prayers that are said every night. And it's because there's a belief that the a soul actually stays on earth for up to nine days after death. So the whole purpose of this novena is to pray for, you know, the safe passage and peaceful passage of a soul into heaven. Um, at the 40th day, there is prayers, a mass or a gathering. And we believe that on the 40th day, the soul of a person has now, um, you know, uh, transitioned and moved into heaven. One year later, so again, right, we started with nine, 40 days, and then now we're 365. One year later, we practice something called babang luksa. Baba is um, like decline, luksa is grieve or mourning, right? So it's the end of the mourning period. Um, and now if you go even further down south to the Philippines where we have a huge Muslim community, the practice primarily is to bury or cremate the dead within 24 hours or before the sun goes down. Um, back in the day, that practice began to avoid, you know, the spread of sickness, um, you know, during the plague, trying to avoid infection or contamination. But what's really interesting is um, whether you're Christian or Muslim, that there is a practice in the Philippines to say the prayers on the 40th day where we believe that a soul now transitions into heaven. But given that there has been so much colonization that's happened in the Philippines over centuries, right? So with our um, Chinese influence, the Spanish, um, and even um, what we call the Moro or the Muslim um, influence, what sort of happened, which is the most fascinating part to me, is that so much of our ancestral and cultural traditions have really prevailed. So when I say this, what I actually mean is that there are certain traditional practices that we generally abide by. For example, um, there's one practice called bug bug, which means to dust off, right? And what this means is that if you go to a wake, that you're not supposed to um, 
go home, like go straight home, you need to stop off somewhere, like whether it's a gas station or, you know, down the street and be sure that you kind of have a stopover before you go home. The reason for this is because you don't want to bring death home with you, right? And in the same vein, when you go to a wake, um, the practice is that you're not supposed to take home any food or drink or anything that's served. And furthermore, the bereaved family is not supposed to escort any of the guests to the door or to their car so that death doesn't go with them. Um, there's also a practice called, what's well, not so much a practice rather than it is a belief, um, you know, one of the one of the things that I love about being Filipino is that there's so much of like a spiritual awakeness. I want to say um, a lot of people are healers um, have, you know, uh, are gifted with being able to connect with um, spirits, ancestors, etc. in in different ways. Right. There's actually a practice or a tradition that we call not so much a tradition, I think, but more of like a, a phenomenon. Right. I think that's a better word. It's called paramdam. And the root word of that is ramdam, which means to feel or to sense. And paramdam actually means that um, when someone passes away and you get a whiff of cologne or you see a butterfly or you see someone in a dream that the, what they what they say that means is that the person who passed on is actually visiting you to either bid their farewell or asking for prayers. So what's really interesting, I think, like, you know, in in summary, I think what's really interesting is that there is sort of a common belief amongst all Filipinos that even after you pass on, that somehow your ancestors are not just in a faraway place called heaven, right, wherever that may be. But actually, it kind of goes back to our ancestral belief that God and our ancestors are among us. And as a matter of fact, you know, I'm very much, I identify as Filipinx American, although I was raised in the Philippines. But as I look around me in this room, I see photographs of my grandfather, my favorite nanny, my grandmother, my uncle, who have all passed on. And I talk to them as if they're still alive, you know? So um, I really love that somehow the ancestral practice and the ancestral traditions have really kind of like become so predominant irrespective of what religion you practice in the Philippines. Fabulous, so fascinating, Kisa. Um, so Chike, you had mentioned um, that you are a practicing Catholic yourself. And you know, I'm fascinated because I know Robin, you're, Cat well, I wouldn't say practicing Catholic, but <laughs> Catholic. But, you know, and yet the manifestation of these rituals that you have within the cultures are so different. So talk to us, Chike, a little bit about how do you, in your culture, despite being Catholic, you're still maintaining some of those other uh, traditions that predated Catholicism in Nigeria. Oh, yeah, um, it's, it's actually, and, and again, even just as, you know, case I was talking, the thing that is beautiful, and I talk about this quite a bit in terms of, the intersection points of Christianity and traditional practice um, that um, a lot of people, in fact, over 70 percent of people from my region of Nigeria are actually Catholics um, because of our relationship with the Irish you know, missionaries. Uh, a lot of the schools that were set up back in the you know, 1800s and the early 1900s we are all built by Irish missionaries. And so there's a lot of that and very, very devout Christians and Catholics. But what you find is that what we, we have been able to figure out a way um, to achieve an interest in harmony. Uh, this happens in rituals around naming, um, um, weddings, you know, and in this case, um, funerals that people actually go to mass, you know, go to the requiem mass, go do all of that. But then, um, then they come back to their family stead and their compound and then perform, you know, do all these other rituals. Not even, in fact, sometimes the Reverend Fathers come in and help guide in the prayers, you know? And so, you know, there's no longer discord. There was a time um, when there was a discord, when of course there was just this, notion that anything from traditional society or traditional cultures was from the devil, you know, and could, could not and would not be allowed in church. Um, but it took time uh, with Vatican Council and all of that and the push by the, you know, by the African bishops to say, 
Uh, music, drumming is our way of life. This is communication. This is who we are. This is our identity. And if we are going to be Christians, uh, we are actually going to have to practice and use the things that, 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 that really elevate us to a whole different level. And so there is now an interest in, and yet there's still some very, very, if you will, um, traditionalist in the sense of the Christian faith that will say, um, no, don't do this or don't do that. Uh, but more often than not, um, there are some of these elements that you find, even in the way church mass is celebrated. You know, um, you know, there are things, you know, people bring offerings and when, when they're going to do their offering, they're bringing yams and different kinds of things and animals. And, you know, these are things, you know, from culture. And, 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 and somehow we're able to understand um, that when you talk about, you know, death and the great beyond, you talk about ancestors in the, you know, in the church, you talk about saints and patron saints. Um, you talk about moving on to, you know, the spirit hovering and all of that. Um, you talk about purgatory, you know, you talk about, you know, moving from there to the next, you know, so there are so many things that tie all of this together. Where the friction, you know, comes is where one, you know, believes that there is a superior to the other and therefore the other is wrong, um, which happened and continues to happen to some extent. But I think we are now getting to the point where, uh, the Africans, just on a general scale, are uh, asserting the fact that their practices come from old, come from millennia, and they are not inferior to anyone else. And so we are going to take, you know, this, which we are identifying with, but take it on our own terms and, uh, and make it work. So it's, it's working somehow, you know, yeah. So, um I was hoping that both of you could talk a little bit too about, because we started this with Dia de los Muertos and music. And, um, and of course, Dia de los Muertos is very much about uh, artistic expression, creative expression, because they make the ofrendas and they make a lot of things. And there's of course music and celebration and dance. And so I was wondering if you could talk about your traditions um, that touch on those kind of creative expressions, dance, music, song, uh, within your practices. What I can say is that um, in the Philippines, uh, generally, our version of Dia de los Muertos is celebrated on All Souls Day, which is on November 2nd. But in the Philippines, people will actually begin to visit, um, you know, the cemeteries and mausoleums as early as October 31st. And believe it or not, they camp out there at the cemeteries. <laughs> it turns into a party, right? Filipinos love to party. And so therefore, there's always a, there's always a lot of food Right? So they bring the favorite dishes of their deceased ancestors. There's a lot of music. So pe whether it's karaoke <laughs> or people are singing, you know, people love to sing in the Philippines. They say everyone's a singer, right? <laughs> um, but what's really interesting is that the very wealthy people in the Philippines, their mausoleums are actually almost like houses with bedrooms, kitchens, and air conditioning, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. Because it's such a big thing in the Philippines that come All Souls Day, you know, they know that there's going to be a party, there's going to be a lot of music, it's all about joyfulness, right? But I think what's really interesting is um, usually during funerals itself, it's not uncommon, especially in the provinces, to have like a local band walk during the procession from the house or the mortuary into, um, into the graveyard or the cemetery, right? And what's really interesting to me is that although, yes, there is an influence of more Christian like worship music, right? There's also a lot of love songs. So it's not necessarily about romantic love, but if you listen to the lyrics of the music in Filipino or in different dialects, it's really about an unconditional, like beautiful love that's almost romantic, but not, you know? Like even the lyrics, like one of the songs that I, that, that's actually coming to mind is called Maala Ala Mukaya. And it, re it, it literally translates into Will You Remember, right? But the, the lyrics are so beautiful. Like, when I'm gone, will you remember me? Because if you open up my heart, you'll see a picture, like a picture frame of you in my heart, right? Like, it, it's so beautifully done. Um, but 
even more interesting is that the live band music that walks from the home to the cemetery reminds me so much of what I've also seen in New Orleans. Yes, me too. Very, I was just going to say that. Yes. Yeah. And very the mausoleums that are like houses. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> they're, and, they're above yeah. ground. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're right. like houses. Yeah. And there, there's whole cemeteries of them and the bands march in and it's, yeah. And, and, and you know, and the, the thing with um, amongst the Igbos and most uh, a good deal of, because I'm, I'm also very, you know, um, in sync with other traditional cultures within the African, you know, region, um, we don't really have um, that type of relationship um, with death. Um, however, the rituals around, um, when I say that type of relationship, we don't go camp out in the cemetery and stuff like that. There is a certain, a certain reverence of sorts, not that that is not a reverence, but the way we in interpret our relationship to the, you know, to, to cemeteries or burial grounds, it's different that we don't go and, you know, do things. However, the process of sending somebody home, the, you know, there is, um, there are two phases to the actual funeral and the, you know, the process of transition or bidding somebody farewell. You know, the first is a very straightforward, you know, um, mourning, if you will. Then the second phase of that is the celebration that happens, you know, perhaps 40 days later, one year later. In the ritual around the funeral, um, because, I mean, our culture is such that music is everything. Music is really the, the theme of life. Um, there's the music for going to the farm, the music for everything. And so there are funeral, there are types of songs and dance that are specific. Um, and in these gestures of the movement and all of that, you could even see the story unfolding before your eyes that they are bidding this person farewell. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting the way very intricate um, movements and all of that. And also there is um, a time at the very beginning of the funeral process, um, the, the, the children of the, let's assume that the person that's passed is old enough to have had grown children. The children of the deceased, um, go with the, uh, because we have an age grade system, you know, so the people from your clan or people that are around your age will now come to you. And there is a dance and a song that they usher you in with. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the colleagues of the deceased are the first people that come out. And when they are chanting, if you listen, they're actually saying, we are looking for the person, you know, so they're calling the person's name and saying, we are searching. Have you seen this person? Have you seen this? And then there's a response that says, the person is here. The person is here, you know, and it goes on and on and on. And then you would see that later on when that song changes in the second ceremony, they are actually no longer saying we are searching. They are affirming that they know that the person has arrived. And, uh, but then the age grade process of the children coming in, they are coming in and they're singing and the, the person whose dad or mom is passed has this very graceful dance steps that they are taking and they're bringing them in and they're ushering the person in and they're surrounded by their peers, you know, saying, we got you, you know, we're here, you know, and all of that stuff. And it's a very, very interesting process. And then, um 40 days later as the case may be a year later they come back which you know the westerners now call second burial because they don't understand that as we don't call it second burial but you know um but it is now a celebration it is a time where we come to affirm that yes we did it 
the, we've gained actually a seat on the council in the ancestral life. You know, it's like, you know, we just voted somebody in and, you know, there's no recount now. We know the person is there, the person got there, the person has been sworn in, you know, yeah. and so we've gained an ancestor. And gosh, what else? You know, you can ask the person for anything. They can guide, protect you, all of that stuff. So that part of it is a lavish celebration. You know, it's just joyous. Uh, food, everything is there. Uh, and and so the music and dance reflect that as well. And you know, I'm thinking about um, in the Hindu tradition, and you know, in India, there's it's so diverse that these, when I say Hindu, these are general principles. They may vary a little bit by you know the sect and region and so on. But one thing that I was struck when I came here first um, uh, was just how you know death was somewhat sanitized, right? We over here, when somebody dies you know, the undertaker comes and takes them away, you come back home. In India, it's very raw, right? First of all, you're required to kind of finish with all the rites and, and cremate, you know, pretty much by sundown. Um, these days it's different because families moved and migrated. So people have to arrive from out of town, but the body is right there. And they have rules about, you know, the head has to face a certain way, the toes have to be a certain way. And there's meaning behind all of that. But, you know, as kids, we were not shielded from that. If, if somebody died, kids are right there, right? They're right there. They see what happens. They see the rawness of it. I was telling Robin, they're also people who have the equivalent of lament, right? They're wailing and crying. And sometimes they're doing it in a very poetic way, right? They will say things like, oh my God, just last week I saw you at the grocery store and today you're gone, right? Things like that. <laughs> but they're very mundane on one level, but all of these rituals and things that happen and they happen in community, right? Everybody comes, right? Everybody comes. They know that something is happening in this house. Um, friends, family, neighbors, they all come. And I think they help the family cope with the loss, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that the structure and the fact that you have to go through these rituals, even though you would just rather just sit in a corner and cry. The fact that your loved one needs to have a safe passage to the next plane. And if you don't go through those things in precisely the kind of prescribed ways, you're gonna deprive them of that. That belief gives people the strength to get through those horrible days, right? And it's so fascinating that it's true across cultures. Yeah, and the affirmation, knowing, like you said, knowing that, and I think, uh, I think um, Kisa put it rightly, knowing that the person has now become spirit and is still with you. Yes. So it, there's no, this, I think what is so traumatizing is the finality of death yes. in other cultures. And so when, it's, when death is seen as everything has been cut off, the mm -hmm. person is gone, vanished. Mm -hmm. But in cultures like ours, where we know all that has happened is the person has transitioned to another plane. And if we were part of that transition, if we did our part in moving the person up, really, then we have actually gained something, yes. you know? And, and then in my culture, we believe in reincarnation and the person is gonna come back. And so, yes, it is painful. It is, yeah, nobody's making light of that. There's crying, there's, you know, sadness and all of that. But somehow there is that, understanding too that the person is still here as a matter of fact has now elevated you know so there's it's it's interesting and all the grieving and and the crying and all of that is therapy uh, yeah. the rituals right. uh, and so people don't go crazy afterwards and depressed and, um, and you're surrounded there are people actually that are assigned if yes. it's the woman whose husband has passed there are people that are literally assigned from the day it happens. They are with the person, even if you wish that they can get away, they are tied on to you <laughs> for the whole period. Oh, gosh. You know? so anyway, but yeah, but you're right. You know, um, in my culture, when the person is, you know, you know, resting, so to speak, as we call it, the, the person's feet have to be towards the door. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, um, and it's interesting because in growing up, if you if you know if you fall asleep and you move your foot towards the door, they're gonna smack you. You know, say, you know, just you can't do that. You know, that, 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 that. Right, right, right. It's really fascinating. Well, this has been so wonderful. 
I hope everyone on here has enjoyed this conversation. If you have any questions and you, you want to pop them in the comment section of Q&A, please do. If not, you know, honestly, this discussion has been so enriching. And again, I hope we can all recognize that here we are, the four of us, and look at all the musicians that were also very diverse, representing many different you know, cultures and traditions. Here we are, we are all Americans, and yet we all have such rich, unique um, manifestations of our culture, but yet at the end of the day, we are able to relate to each other, right? Compare and contrast, and we're all part of the same beautiful mosaic. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for doing this. This is fabulous. Thank you, Chike, Kisa, and Robin, as always. Um, and folks on, here, on this, please um, do come back for our next program, and you will find us on social media as well as on the web. Uh, we are at mosaicamerica.org, and the San Jose Museum of Art is at S-J-M-U-S-A-R-T. So please find us and follow us, and we thank you. And we thank you too. Thank you very much for joining another uh, wonderful Third Thursday program with Mosaic America. And um, we have a, I just have to have a little commercial time here. We have a couple of um, very, in fact, it's actually kind of um, interesting uh, tied into this. We have a very interesting exhibition opening tomorrow. Um, but the celebration of the opening will be on December 3rd for our first Friday. So I hope everybody will come, but it's called our whole unruly selves. And it is also about identity, but about our physical selves as well. And how we, um, how much that's changed and how we feel about that. And the whole idea of flattening your identity into one thing, as opposed to the very complicated um, messiness that is the human condition. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's a very interesting different take on sort of figurative art. So I hope everybody will uh, come out and see that and see us as well. And um, thank you so much, Usha, for putting together another great program. It was wonderful to have you both here, Kisha and, and Chika. We, it was really great to yeah. um, hear about your traditions too. So we could go on for another three we hours. Could. We could go on for hours. I have a feeling this is a huge yes, subject yes. and it is <laughs> unfortunate that it isn't discussed much in <laughs> our culture. And I think that people do want right. to talk about it and want to hear about it and think about it, especially when you think about it right now. So many people in this country have in the last year been touched by doubt. Yeah. They say one in five or seven Americans has lost somebody in the somebody, last year. Yeah. It's a yeah, lot. Absolutely. So yeah. um, it's a- well, We it's will a, share by email a link to this program. Yeah, that it's a really important subject. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. And um, please look for an email that we send out, which will also provide links to Chike and Kisa's work. And um, we hope that we will see you back here again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.